Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is taken from our gospel reading, the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 7, verses 31 through 37. Please be seated. Dear fellow redeemed in Christ, one day a little boy opened the big family Bible and he was looking at each page with fascination. As he turned the page, suddenly something fell out of that Bible. He picked it up and looked at it closely. It was an old leaf from a tree that had been pressed between the pages. Mama, look what I found, he said. What have you got there? The mother replied. Completely amazed, the boy answered, I think it's Adam's suit. (laughs) Get it? Adam's suit. Adam and Eve. Have you ever been amazed at something? From time to time, I'm able to catch the TV show Penn and Teller Fool Us. I don't know if any of you have seen that. Master illusionists, Penn and Teller, invite other amateur illusionists to their theater in Las Vegas to perform in front of a live audience. The goal is to fool two of the best illusionists in the business. In one of the more memorable episodes, a young man takes a Rubik's Cube that has been all mixed up, and he takes it and he tosses it behind his back in the air with one hand, and he catches it. And when he catches it, he shows it to the camera, and the Rubik's Cube is completely solved. Amazing. And oh, by the way, he did fool Penn and Teller. Yet as amazing as that trick was, it does not compare to what our Lord does in our text for today. You see, what Jesus does is not a sleight of hand, nor is it an illusion. Rather, what Jesus does is real. Absolutely, positively real. Our text begins with Jesus and his disciples in the region of the Decapolis, a Greek name for ten cities. These cities on the east southeast coast of the Sea of Galilee were highly influenced by Greek culture and they were populated mainly by Gentiles. Jesus had been in this area at least once before and obviously his reputation preceded him. Here we read some people brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Now what Jesus does next is truly, truly amazing. Our text says that Jesus pulls the man aside to a private place and then puts his fingers in the man's ears and after spitting touches his tongue and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, that is, be open. First and foremost, what's most amazing is how Jesus is so personal in this reading. He is not some God who is far away from his creation. Nor does he create things and then let it go on its own. No, Jesus is very, very hands-on. He is active and he is involved in the lives of individuals. The second thing is that Jesus looks up to heaven. He acknowledges his heavenly Father for the giver of all good things giving him the glory. Now, after doing these things, our text says the man's ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Now, I would guess that it's hard, it's difficult, for most of us here to imagine being deaf 
and then having the joy of hearing for the first time. So often we take things in life for granted, simple things like the ability to hear. I like to think that after this event, this man took nothing for granted anymore. He could now hear his friends, his family, his Savior. Not only could he hear, but we are told that he could talk plainly so that others could hear and understand him. And this is another example of our God going above and beyond the call of duty. Not only did this man receive hearing, but Jesus gave this man a voice. He could talk to others. He could share his thoughts and his needs and his wants and his ideas. He did not need a speech therapist. All he needed was Jesus. And Jesus was all too willing to set him free from his prison. Now, if you were in the Decapolis that day, if you were watching this event, would you have been amazed? You know, I often wonder if Jesus amazes people today. One thing is clear, the people who saw this event firsthand were amazed. Our text says that Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more he charged them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. You know, it's rather puzzling to read how Jesus responds after healing this man. Our text says again that he charges them to tell no one. You would think that Jesus would want everyone to know. You would think that he would want everyone to go out who has seen this event and tell others. This is not so. You see, Jesus was on a mission. His mission was not necessarily to restore this man's hearing and speech. He did that. But his mission was much broader than that. His mission was to save the world from everlasting condemnation. His mission was to restore sight and speech and health and life to all people. His mission was to give eternal drink to the thirsty and eternal food to the hungry. Jesus' mission was to restore creation back to what it originally was before sin entered and corrupted it. But our text says that the people could not remain quiet. They were so amazed by what they saw Jesus do that they blurted out, He has done all things well. Literally, in the Greek, it reads, Good in everything He has done. Yet I often wonder, I often wonder how long their amazement lasted. Was there a point in time when that awe and that amazement wore off. What about us? The Greek word here for deaf can also be translated dull or blunt. What about us? Do we feel like we have heard these readings so often, time and time again in church, or in Sunday school, that we know Jesus so well that he is yesterday's news, that the Christian faith isn't relevant anymore, that we are too enlightened for that. You know, I think that a lot of people in our world think that way. I know a lot of young people see Christianity as grandma and grandpa's religion, and that it represents a bygone era. And churches struggle to keep the youth in the doors. 
But what we don't realize is that Christianity is relevant. Jesus Christ is relevant because Christ is the only Savior of the world. There is no other way to heaven. There is no other way to eternal life than through Jesus Christ. Now the question is, how are we, as people in the know, how are we going to communicate that message to a generation that has grown dull to Christianity? How are we going to pass on what has been passed on to us? In our text, Jesus tells the people not to say anything. But do they listen? No. Instead, they go and tell everyone. Why is it that when Jesus says, do not tell anyone, they go and tell everyone, yet when he, Jesus says, tell everyone, they remain quiet? It's kind of puzzling to me. As I stated before, there is a whole generation of people to whom Jesus has become dull. According to the Pew Research Group, one-fifth of, of the American population and one-third of adults under 30 are unaffiliated with a particular religion. I recently heard a, a term that described these people. They are the nones, N-O-N-E-S, the nones. The nones are the fastest-growing segment in our country. To them... Jesus Christ is not all that amazing anymore. As believers in Jesus Christ, we've got our work cut out for us because Jesus is not dull. All you have to do is open your Bibles and read about him. And maybe that's the problem. The further we get away from the Bible the less excited we become with Jesus. Conversely, the more involved we are with the Bible, that is, the more we read it, the more we study it, the more we hear it proclaimed, the more amazed and excited we become for our Lord. I think there's a direct relationship there. We must remain in God's Word because the Bible says by nature, we humans are no different than the man who was deaf and mute in our text. The Bible says that we are spiritually deaf and mute. We could not hear God's truth, nor could we clearly speak his praises. So the one who does all things well left his heavenly throne and he came for us each and every one of us, including the nons. He came to a manger. He came to a cross in order to carry our sins. He came to a tomb to assure us that everything was all right with God. By his life and by his sacrifice, Jesus won for us and the entire world salvation. He came to us with this good news. And he said to us, Ephetha. And he opened our ears to hear the message of forgiveness, peace, joy, and love. In his Holy Supper today, Jesus comes to us yet again, and he touches our lips and gives us forgiveness and strength. And we hear his word. Be open, Ephetha, and our lips become unsealed as we consume his body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And as we then go out from this place, singing his praises and telling others, especially those who are unamazed by Jesus. There's no doubt about it, my friends. Jesus is amazing. 
His mercy and His power and His love leave us feeling overwhelmed. So overwhelmed that we blurt out, He does all things well. To know that a sinner like me stands completely forgiven before God each and every day of my life is no less amazing. To know that God's love will never fail to know that He has won for us eternal life, to know that He has prepared a mansion for us in heaven, to know Jesus, to hear His word, to receive His body and blood, and to be able to sing His praises is truly amazing. Now, my friends, we have been empowered by God's word. Let us go out and proclaim that word to all people. Through words and actions, let us show others just how amazing Jesus is. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.